previously on Chemistry, Chemistry Z. Z. Our heroes journeyed to the mountains of Group Zero to meet the ancient noble gases. They finally answered that ancient question of whether boiling point increases as you move up the group or down the group. And now, with this knowledge, they journey to the other side of the periodic table to meet the explosive alkaline mountains of Group 1. Will our heroes be able to pattern the word and symbol equation lurking in the mist? Find out in today's exciting episode of Chemistry, Chemistry Z. Z. Here are the retrieval questions for this lesson. You know what to do. The atomic number is the same as the number of protons in an atom. The period an element is on tells you the number of electron shells that it contains. You can work out the number of neutrons by taking away the relative atomic mass, the large number, from the atomic number. Group 1 elements are called alkaline metals for a reason that we'll discuss in a second. As mentioned in my video on electronic configuration, you only need to concern yourself with from lithium up to potassium because we don't go further than calcium in GCSE. But these examiners may be cheeky and you may have to apply your knowledge further for the higher marks. All you have to do is memorize the trends in their physical and chemical properties and then apply it. Yes, science! Let's first look at some physical properties. Density is the amount of mass you have in a given volume. Check my video on the density required practical for more detail on that. Here I have a bar chart showing the densities of the different elements in group 1 and a simplified periodic table to remind you of the order. Use these two to describe the pattern that is shown here. This is two marks. Use the center starter here if you're stuck. We see that the overall density seems to increase. That's one mark. But potassium has a lower density than expected. That's your second mark there. If you're asked to compare alkaline metals to regular metals like zinc and iron, Alkaline metals all have low densities compared to regular metals. Alkaline metals have low densities. Now let's look at the melting points. Oh, so Just like before, describe the pattern shown in this bar chart showing the melting points of the different alkaline metals. That should have been straightforward. As you move down group 1, the overall melting point decreases. Since this was just one mark, we don't have to give more detail than that. This table shows the melting point of different metals and as you can see, the metals that have very high melting points are not in group 1. So alkaline metals also have relatively low melting points compared to other metals. The last physical property that we're going to look at is boiling point. <laughs> yeah, boy. That's it. Just like before, describe the trend you see. And since this is two marks, you should give two distinct observations in your answer. As you move down group one, the boiling point decreases one mark. But the differences between the boiling points also decrease. That's the second mark. Look at the large difference between lithium and sodium and then the small difference between rubidium and cesium. Alkaline metals are also very soft compared to regular metals. They can be cut with a knife and you probably remember this in the alkaline metals and water demonstration. Now let's look at the reaction with water. Notice the difference as we move from the top of the group all the way down to the bottom. The reason for this difference is very fascinating, but first, we shall look at the word equation. Why, man? Why? This is actually very, very simple. When a metal reacts with water, it forms a metal hydroxide and hydrogen. That is basically it. Use this general equation in red to complete the word equations for each of these reactions.
That should have been mad straightforward. The first one, lithium plus water gives you lithium hydroxide and hydrogen. That's what's missing. The second one, let's look at the metal hydroxide that's formed. That's sodium hydroxide. So we must have added sodium. Sodium plus water gives us sodium hydroxide and hydrogen. And then the metal we're using is potassium. So we're forming potassium hydroxide. Simple. You also need to be able to work out the symbol equations for these reactions as well. Now here's the tricky part. Here is the general symbol equation. Notice the difference in color. The red bits will always stay the same. Memorize the red bits. All that is changing is the black M, which is the metal. Don't forget to put the twos in front of each except for the hydrogen. Two twos now. Use this general equation in red to write the complete symbol equations for each of these reactions. So for the first one, we're missing the hydrogen, the H2, and the state symbol showing us a gas. The next one, we're missing the sodium hydroxide, so 2NaOH aqueous. And then for the last one, we're missing the potassium. So 2K for the potassium and then the S showing us is a solid. Here is why these metals are called alkali metals. Notice that they're producing hydroxides. OH is an hydroxide and that is alkali. So it turns the pH of your solution higher. Remember from my video on the neutralization with pride practical that anything higher than pH 7 is an alkali. The second reaction is with oxygen. This is the general word equation for that. You know what to do, so do the thing. Well, for the first one, we add a sodium, so we're forming sodium oxide. The next one, cesium plus something gives us cesium oxide, we must have added oxygen and then we're forming potassium hydroxide, so the metal that we added was potassium. Straightforward tanks. And the final thing that we have to do is the general equation for the symbol equations, which is this. This one looks a bit more complicated, but just like before, memorize the red bits. You're only changing the big black M, which stands for your metal. Do your tank. First one, we're missing the sodium oxide, the 2Na subscript 2 and O. Next one, we're missing the cesium, so 4 cesium and then the solid. And the last one, we're missing the potassium oxide, so 2K2O solid. The final thing we have to see is the reasons for the different reactivities as we move down group 1. Just prepare to go to hell. Look, chill man. Here is a little reminder of that. So remember, lithium was not as reactive as potassium. And sodium was more reactive than lithium, but not as reactive as potassium. You could get a question asking you to explain the trends as you move down group one. And this could easily be a five or six mark question. So let's not take this as a joke. By answering, each of these smaller questions, you should be able to gain the majority of your marks. Pause the video and have a go answering these four questions. It's the protons in the nucleus that are attracted to the electrons. The number of shell increases as you go down group one. Lithium and potassium are both going to lose that one outer shell electron to form a stable configuration. Remember in my video on noble gases, everyone wants to be a noble gas. And then finally, potassium's outer electrons is further away from the nucleus, so it's easier for it to lose. That's why it's easier for it to react. It's losing that electron very, very easy compared to lithium. If you're looking for those top marks though, make sure you can write out your answer like this. The electrons in the outermost shell become less strongly attached 
to the positive nucleus or you can say to the protons. The electrostatic attraction, so that force that's holding the electrons and close to the protons is electrostatic. So the electrostatic attractions with the nucleus is weaker because of the greatest distance. Remember, the potassium atom is larger so the electrons are further away. And also, this is the last thing that students always forget, the inner shells also shield the outer electrons. That means that they're blocking the positive attraction, that electrostatic attraction from the nucleus. Here is a five mark question based on group two. I feel, oh, my heart crack. Again, your group two isn't part of the syllabus, but they could ask you to apply your knowledge from group one and apply it to group two, okay? This question is an extended writing task and it's asking you to predict the differences in the reactivity seen between group two elements, magnesium and calcium. You're just applying what we did for group one. The only difference here is that they're losing two electrons and not one electron. All right, pause the video, do your thing. This is five marks. And here are the answers. Calcium is more reactive than magnesium because the calcium is a larger atom than magnesium. So the electrons in calcium are further away from the positive electrostatic um, forces. You can say that from the nucleus or the proton. Therefore, it is easier for it to lose its electrons. And there we go. Lesson done. Fatality. We looked at the group one trends in physical and chemical properties. Use the timestamps to skip to what you want to look at again. Check out the flashcards that I have in the description and also my revision timetable. And I'll catch you guys in a bit.